Okay, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for being here. So I'm going to talk today about uh, sort of a half of the uh, kind of the research that we do in our group, and that half deals with the the environmental implications of energy extraction and use. And that's the subject that, that we'll be talking about today. Uh, Jimmy mentioned we do a lot of other work, uh, climate change related, uh, drought related, and particularly uh, ecosystems and water use is, a, is a, a special interest of mine. So for that, I get to go caving and do other things that, that, that keep life interesting, so and take measurements underground. Um, but anyway, um, about uh, six or eight, uh, maybe eight, closer to eight or 10 years ago, after giving many talks about climate change and other things, uh, but not really doing any direct energy related research. I finally realized that I had to, or uh, wanted to incorporate some of that in my research program. So I worked on, and uh, have worked on carbon capture and storage, but about six or eight years ago became interested in, in unconventional energy extraction, particularly shale gas and shale oil extraction. So here's a photo, I'll start with this that I took from a helicopter. You're in the Marcellus in Pennsylvania. This is one of the larger, one of the largest shale gas plays in the US and the world. And uh, this is while a hydraulic fracturing operation is going on. It is not like this most of the time. This is just, just temporary. So you see tanks, you see compressors, you see water trucks, you see lots of things going on. And then you see that house in the back left corner up here. And I guess what I want you to think about is how your perspective on that operation might differ depending on your economic interest in what's going on outside your door. So in some cases, the people who live in those houses own the mineral rights to their land and, uh, and, and reap the economic benefits of that activity. In other cases, in the US, we have severed mineral rights, where someone else might own the, the mineral rights, but you own the surface rights. Or that might be a well pad on your neighbor's property, and it's as close to your property as it legally can be and as far away from their house as it can be. So I think in each of these, each of these cases, and there are you know, 20,000 or so of these uh, hydraulic fracturing operations each year, each of these plays out in a small microcosm like that. And I think this is one of the reasons why, um, why this issue is so contentious. The philosophy of this component of our research project is how to, to minimize uh, the environmental footprint of, of uh, operations like this. So how can we reduce the amount of water that's used? Uh, how can we uh, reduce any air quality impacts that might occur? And really I'm interested in, in some sense in the exceptions. So what is it about the couple of percent, half a percent, up to five or 10% of operations, um, depending on what you're talking about, that might have something that goes, that goes wrong? And how can we learn from those and keep them from happening elsewhere? And that's really the focus of what I'm gonna talk about today. So we'll focus first on water, then on air. But first, this is like a, a get to know you dance. Uh, I'll just give you a little background on some other things I do. I, I am passionate about writing. So I've published a couple of children's poetry books. Uh, if you've ever read Highlights Magazine in the, in the dentist's office or you have kids, um, they've done uh, uh, the uh, books in the upper left and the upper right um, of mine. Uh, trade book about the environment, a couple of textbooks. So I, I write uh, and read as much as I can, anything that's not peer reviewed as often as I can. Uh, Jimmy mentioned I, uh, I chair the Global Carbon Project. I have a co-chair also, uh, Naki Nakisenovich in Austria. Uh, the GCP has been around about 15 years. Among other things, we publish an annual carbon dioxide budget. So we take emissions data from companies like uh, BP, but then we use models and, and inversions to attribute where the carbon dioxide goes. So every year we, put it, uh, we publish a budget, how much went into the atmosphere from land use like deforestation, from fossil fuel emissions, from cement production and things like that, and then we track it, how much of it stays in the atmosphere, so that what you actually measure in that rising CO2 trace. How much goes into the oceans um, for sort of free sequestration but has consequences for things like ocean acidity down the road? And how much goes back into the land in areas like Europe or the United States where because we cut our forests 100 years ago and those forests are regrowing, we have carbon sinks over, over large areas of the temperate, uh, of the temperate globe. So we, we re, uh, release a global CO2 budget every year. We have a, a methane budget we've started doing now. We have a global carbon atlas that's a sort of an outreach or stakeholder tool that allows people to, to go in and look and see where the carbon is in different pools around the world, biotic, abiotic, fossil fuel pools, and things like that. And increasingly, even in, in the Global Carbon Project, we're interested in unconventional natural gas and oil because, uh, because it's become so important, because it's transformed energy production in the United States to the point where we now produce as much oil as Saudi Arabia does, something that was unthinkable uh, 10 or 20 years ago. Um, this is a, a map that many of you, the kind of map that many of you would, would have seen. These are shale resources around the world. There are other 
tight sands and other unconventional resources on here. I think the main thing to, to take home from this slide is just how much of this there is out there. It's not all the same. It's not all the same depth, not all the same quality, not all the same carbon content. But what's happened in North America in particular can and might be replicated elsewhere depending on a lot of factors, geological, human, economic, and otherwise. Not much. Um, there are other people in the room who, uh, who can chime in if they feel like. Uh, basically, the, the North American plays none in Mexico. Uh, Argentina's drilled a few hundred wells to this point. They're one of the countries the most likely to, to proceed quickly. Uh, the UK's doing some extraction. Uh, China's uh, drilling exploratory wells. Other countries are tinkering with it, but in terms of actual production, it's really uh, North American. The yellow blob. I don't know, because I've never been there. Uh, Russia has large, uh, large unconventional resources as well. Does anyone know what that is? The name for it? I don't. All right. So I said we'd start with with water issues, and I want to each of the steps that we take through this this talk. I want to I want to um, I want to cover things that go well, and also where some opportunities are to to have things go perhaps a little better, and why, and how we can do something about it. These are just a handful of examples of many things that, that are improvements, if you will, from the last five or 10 years. Uh, I'd like to highlight the reuse, the increase of, of uh, recycling and reuse of water in the Marcellus, in particular, in Pennsylvania. So we generate about a trillion gallons of, of uh, wastewater from oil and gas operations a year in this country. In the Marcellus, for a number of reasons, they are recycling and reusing most of that wastewater rather than deep injecting it or transporting it. And such. So they're treating it, reusing it, and that's a good, that's a really positive advance. There's much more disclosure about the chemicals used in fracturing fluids, even though uh, many of you might hear or read about there's no chemical disclosure or such. That's not true. There's a patchwork of states that have different regulations about how much you have to disclose, whether or not you have to disclose just the identity of chemicals or the concentrations that are used. And you can think of the, the label on a food product as one example that will list for you what's in a food product but doesn't tell you precisely how much is in that food product, uh, partly for trade secret reasons. And then finally, uh, another example would be the green completions that are happening through uh, uh, new EPA rules and company initiatives, uh, the elimination of open wastewater pits in many areas around the country, and things like that. So what are some things that we study? Why do we study them, and what might people be concerned about? Well, the water used for hydraulic fracturing is an important issue, particularly in drier areas. So in the Marcellus in Pennsylvania, where water is relatively abundant, it's probably not, uh, not as big of an issue, particularly if you don't take too much water from any one stream or river. But if you're in West Texas or North Dakota or out west in the Rockies and you're pumping groundwater, um, then the water supply issue can be quite large. The, the, the amount of water used for hydraulic fracturing can be 10 or tens of percent of the previous water used in a given county, for instance. Um, so, adding, so adding to uh, uh, additional demands on a, on a groundwater resource. There are drinking water quality issues that I'll talk about, uh, what we found in a minority of cases, and then the disposal of this wastewater, the produced waters that I talked about, which in some plays, like the, the Bakken in North Dakota or the Marcellus in Pennsylvania and elsewhere, can be 10 times saltier than seawater, um, can have very high concentrations of, of metals, um, can have dilute radioactivity and other things in it. So, and this is why companies go to so much effort to, to, to handle this wastewater um, as safely as possible, to not just release it into the environment. And, and with a few cases, there are no states allow you, that allow you to do that. Um, reuse, I've already talked about, uh, deep injection. So pumping that wastewater back underground is, is where most of the wastewater goes in this country, more than 90%. But there are still half a dozen states in the US that allow you to spray it on land. Um, you don't have to be a genius or an environmental scientist to know that that's not a great idea long term. But still done um, in rarer cases. Um, down here we have, again, the same picture you saw before. Uh, we've done studies looking at uh, radioactivity associated with wastewater disposal and other things, which is the figure on the right. So let's look at uh, just an overview then of, of water use, where fr hydraulic fracturing is done in the US. This was a paper that came out a couple of years ago. And I'll talk about in this talk, let me mention as an aside, I'll try and mention a number of colleagues as I go along. But in this talk, it's more about uh, 
sort of what our group is doing and has done to give you an introduction to what we do. But in a normal research seminar, I'd be spending more time talking about what other groups around the world are doing. And there are a lot of people and groups in a lot of countries doing this kind of work. Today, we'll focus more sort of on what, what, what we're doing. Well, this is a paper just from a couple of months ago. 44,000 wells, uh, in this case, this, these are uh, data sets disclosed uh, or reported, excuse me, in the, in the FRAC Focus website. Um, so in terms of physical geographic distribution, this is what you see, the Marcellus up there on the right, the plays in Texas, the Barnett, uh, the Eagle Fur, the Permian, some of the western plays, here's the Bakken, North Dakota, some hydraulic fracturing here in, in California, generally of lower volume. Depth-wise, most of it's deep. The average depth of a hydraulic fracturing operation in the U.S. is deeper than a mile. Um, the average water use is about 2.4 million gallons per well. All right. And then, as I talked before about some of the exceptions, there are about 1% of the cases where the hydraulic fracturing is shallow, less than 3,000 feet, and where the water and chemicals used are large, greater than 5 million gallons. And these are the kinds of combinations that I th are more of a concern to me because most of the hydraulic fracturing that's so deep, it's very, very unlikely that you're going to have any contact with that a mile or more underground and surface water and such, except through well integrity possibilities that we'll cover later. But as that distance shrinks, and especially as high volume hydraulic fracturing is occurring near the surface, then some of the safeguards, if you will, aren't as present. So that 1% of, of cases is, the, uh, is an example from the study that we highlighted. That's used, uh, that's for the hydraulic fracturing operation itself. So that does not include things like uh, maintenance water use you would use in a play like the Bakken to, uh, to the, the water use that's during the hydraulic fracturing operation. That might be a couple weeks, a couple days to a, to a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, so many of those are uh, coal bed methane wells. But uh, there are certain states, Arkansas being one of them, where they are shale wells. Good questions. Well, I may have trouble getting through my talk. But keep them coming. Okay, so uh, views of water use. Uh, hydraulic fracturing is water intensive, but one of the things that we've worked a lot on is trying to place data like this in, in a usable metric. So what's an apples to apples comparison? So if someone tells you, a well near you is hydraulically fractured with 2.5 million gallons of water. It sounds like a lot. And it is a lot depending, depending on what you're comparing it to. But what you really need to know to be able to conclude or compare it to something else is how much energy you get back out of the same well. So if it takes more water than a conventional gas well, which it does, but you get a lot more energy back out of that conventional gas well, it can be better than, than a conventional gas well. Or surprisingly, and something you don't hear about very often, is that in a paper we published last year we showed how uh, hydraulic fracturing is less water intensive than many other fuels we're, we're used to using, like coal, nuclear, and, and tar sands. Uh, Nettle at DOE has done some good work in this area too. So it, uh, it's, even though it takes a lot of water to get the, the oil and gas out of the ground, you get a lot of energy back out. Now it's not as good as wind or solar PV, which require uh, no water effectively. All right, so, but it's a, it depends what you compare it to. We need to be careful about the metrics we use. And then finally, um, just in terms of the intensity of hydraulic fracturing, that intensity is increasing. As wells have longer horizontal uh, lateral legs, uh, they're using more water, and the amount of wastewater being generated is generally increasing through time across the U.S. as well. And the lower photos are not mine, those are from the AP. Actually, the one on the right is mine from the Marcellus. The one on the left is, uh, you know, from a drier area of South Texas. And just in thinking about water resources, again, it really, really is, is it really depends on where you are. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that number there, a great question. That number there is for extraction and processing, for sort of handling the fuel, but does not include the, the cooling water demands, the power plant. And natural gas is actually, as many of you know, natural gas is better in many ways than the power plant stage two, again, depending on what you're comparing it to, better than coal, better than nuclear in terms of cooling water. All right, that was water quantity. So let me, let me dig in a little bit to water quality. So this is the work that's probably been the most controversial um, that, that my group's done. This has been in collaboration with Abner Vengosh, uh, my former colleague at Duke. This is, this is an operation where you can you know, think about where, uh, you know, where might something go wrong. 
So I, my first job was with the Dow Chemical Company. I know something about handling chemicals. I know something about uh, corporate safety and other things. I could tell you that the corporate safety of Dow was, was a lot more stringent than the corporate safety at any university I'd ever been to when I walked into a laboratory. <laughs> what people are most worried about is what's going on way down here. Right, here's the hydraulic fracturing operation down through the bottom of the floor, a mile down, two miles down if you're in the Bakken. What we've argued, and what many people have argued, is what we really ought to be concentrating on is what's going on up here. So the surface operations, where the water comes from here, perhaps, if there's a spill occurs, does it reach that waterway? Is there an open wastewater pit? Is that pit lined? Is it unlined? Is that, is that liner intact? Is its integrity intact? Might you have a spill at an operation at the surface, as in any chemical industrial operation that's a possibility? And then here, we've looked a lot at well integrity issues. So not so much what's happening a mile or two mile down, but what's happening a few hundred feet down with the integrity of your well. And that's not a new idea um, to shale gas or to shale oil. All right, so starting about six or seven years ago, um, we published the first studies asking a simple question. We asked, is a homeowner's water any different if he or she lives near an unconventional oil or, oil or gas well compared to if that person lives far away? So is there any distance effect? One of the first plays that we worked in with the USGS was in Arkansas, with Fayetteville. In this play, we found no evidence for any changes in water quality whatsoever. It didn't matter whether somebody was living right next to a well or was very far away from that well. So no evidence for any changes in water quality whatsoever. In the Marcellus, earlier on, we found something that was a little bit different. So we've been working now in the Marcellus for, for six or seven years. We started in the Marcellus and in the northeast corner of the Marcellus for a couple of reasons. One, this was an area, uh, despite Pennsylvania's history of oil and gas extraction, that did not have a long history of oil and gas extraction. There were not many wells in this area compared especially to central and western PA, where some of the earliest wells in the country were. It was also of interest to us because this is the state boundary with New York. New York had, had and still has a, a ban on high volume hydraulic fracturing. Pennsylvania did not, but the geology is the same. So this state border to us is like a fence line comparison if you're working across a landscape. We can learn things about the water here by looking at the water here, even if we can't necessarily go back in time to ask what was a particular water quality like in a well before drilling if we didn't have a pre-drilling sample. So what did we find? Well, I'll just give you a couple of examples and we, could, uh, we can talk all day about this. Um, first, let me start with what we didn't find. So we didn't find any evidence in the Marcellus for, for many things that people are concerned about. Salts, metals, uh, uh, we've never seen evidence for radioactivity associated uh, with the drilling. In rare cases associated with wastewater treatment and streams and such, yes. Um, what we did find evidence for in a minority of cases was, was stray gas contamination. So let me tell you what I, what I mean by that. So here's a, a figure of methane concentration. This is distance to nearest gas well. And each of these dots is somebody's water. So these are the 40 or 50 million people in the US in that subset of people who are on private water wells. So they don't have city water wells, they don't have testing or anything like that to, to monitor the quality of their water. Okay, so most of the people are down here. You see background variation uh, in methane. I'm happy to talk about that uh, in detail. What you see in a subset of cases within about a kilometer distance though is a small subset, and it doesn't look like it's small, but there are a lot of people down here. Right? So there's a, a small subset of people with very high methane concentrations in their water. Right? These are the people that we think uh, have potentially been affected by drilling. We'll talk about next about some of the sourcing, how we, how we might determine or know um, whether that's uh, natural or not. Ethane is up here in the right. Now ethane's even more useful to us and has become particularly useful to me as a researcher because there aren't biological sources of methane of ethane, excuse me. So when we're talking about methane, it's not just about the, the methane from the well itself. There's natural geologically derived methane that's moved up through, through, through many, many years. There are biological sources, microbes in, in aquifers and things like that. You have to tease all that apart in attributing the, the cause or the source of the methane that you see. But ethane's different, right? Ethane has no biological sources. So the ethane signal is much cleaner and the propane signal is like this, the ethane signal is flat, and then bam, you get within a kilometer, and you see a small subset of these homes in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's hard to say, I'm gonna hesitate, it's, it's definitely, it's, 
it's, I'm, I'm going to say small. I'm going to avoid that question for now. I'm happy to talk to you offline. Uh, you can't even do that, so. Um, okay, evidence, or at least a relationship with distance, doesn't prove causality. And I will point out that for those points, we do not have pre-drilling samples. All right, so that's what you would have in a, in a perfect operation, uh, in a perfect case. And that's what you would want to have. We do not have that. So how can we say some things about the sourcing of that methane anyway, even though you can't go back in time? This is one way of many ways that we can do it. Um, this is work with noble gases. Uh, Tom Dara was a postdoc um, who did a lot of this work and had a follow-up paper that came out last year. This is a plot of helium over, over methane. Okay, on the, on the y-axis, noble gases are useful to us because they don't, they're, they're inert. They don't re react. So this is helium, neon, argon, the gases that you're, that you're all familiar with. Same kind of plot, distance with the nearest gas wells. So for people who are across this range, any distance from a gas well, you get a, a sort of a natural variation in helium to methane that's, that looks like that. So why helium-4? Well, helium-4 helium is a decay product. It only comes essentially from underground. It can decay. It moves upwards. If you will. So it's not atmospherically derived, um, uh, you know, moving downwards. So we use noble gases for, to differentiate sources that are rained down into water and sources that are derived um, in the crust itself. All right, so natural range here. Here's a salt spring. Uh, nothing to do with oil and gas drilling. Methane, that's, that's saturation naturally, just water bubbles. Um, very salty water, it's at a value here. Now here are source gases. Marcellus gas itself. So these are actual gas samples from production gas. Intermediate samples found a thousand, a few thousand feet underground. There are other pockets of gas that used to be extracted before the target was the Marcellus, a mile or more underground. Within a kilometer of homes, we see the same variation. Uh, within a kilometer of the gas wells, we see the same variation up here. But then you see the subset of houses. Some of them look just like the intermediate gas. Some of them look like Marcellus gas. Okay, and you don't see those at all uh, beyond that distance. So what's going on? Well, we believe the upper Devonian gases are repre represent issues with cement. So if you have either cement absent or cement that's cracked, you have an intermediate pocket of the gas that can move into the annulus of that gas well, move up the annulus, and then move out into the aquifer. So that gas should not look like Marcellus gas. And that gas will never have the chemicals or anything else associated with hydraulic fracturing in it because there's no breach in the, in, the, in the safety of the casing. Down here, we're not suggesting in any sense that the, that the gas is moving up through thousands of feet of bedrock. We think these are casing leaks. Another, another thing that's not a new idea. So in this case, where you have a casing breach, perhaps the threads that are broken, a, a crack, corrosion, you can have leakage of that gas into the, into the surrounding uh, aquifer. Those cases are a little bit more of a concern because where you have methane leaking, you can have other things that might leak as well. All right, so that's just one example. We spend years and years looking at sourcing and how to, you know, how to say something with confidence about where these gases come from. Um, so well integrity is the key for the stray gas issue. Again, not uh, a new idea to anybody in the, in the oil and gas industry well known. This is a paper that Tom led uh, last year. Lots of different scenarios, some natural, some not. You might have, in a worst case scenario, a hydraulic fracturing operation that uh, connects to a natural fissure. And if you had enough pressure, which is also unlikely, you could have movement upwards. If you're in a fractured geological area like the Marcellus, like some areas of Texas, this kind of movement is a little more plausible, even at surface layers, because there are more natural pathways um, in those rocks for things to move around. So if something goes wrong, you're more likely to see it in water. But that's not what we think is happening here. There was one case that we documented, and it, that was already documented, of an abandoned well that was intersected. What we think is happening are these two cases. So here's a pocket of gas, intermediate level gas, not the target layer, where if you had either no cement or poor cement, that gas could move up into and out into the aquifer. That's the intermediate gas, I believe, that I showed you before. And then here's a casing breach issue. The, the, the gas is moving up through the issue, but if there's a a break in that case, and you can then get moving into the aquifer. So it's all about, it's all about well integrity. Um, this was a paper from last year, Richard Davies in the UK led, uh, but it was an analysis we did of well integrity globally going back in time. It's apples and oranges. It's old, it's new, it's conventional, it's unconventional. It's very hard to compare all these data together in a quantitative way. But this is sort of a compendium, if you will, 
of, of, of different data sets and, and different evidence. And then, um, you know, in sort of finishing up this thread, I do care a lot about making a difference. So like you, I want people to use what I do, and I want it to make a positive difference out there where possible. So here's one example. Pennsylvania passed a law after our first paper came out in 2012. They've, been, they've passed several laws in the last five, six years to enhance casing integrity. In this case, when our first paper came out that was led by Stephen Osborne, we saw this relationship with a one kilometer distance. Again, a minority of people. We said the setback distance in that time for presumptive liability testing for pre-drilling water testing was 1,000 feet. It ought to be 3,000 feet. And so the law was upgraded to, to 2,500 feet. And now 2,500 feet tends to be the standard um, that most states use, not every, not every state. So they increased the setbacks to public water supplies and other things. And then finally, I'm, I'm interested in what happens long term. Uh, so here's a picture of, uh, let's see, in this case, this is Mary Kang's experiment. Uh, she's a postdoc in our group. She's interested in, in methane emissions from legacy wells, if you will. So what, what are we doing now? Perhaps in 25 or 50 years, we might regret that we're doing the way we regret acid mine drainage in, in Pennsylvania now. Um, so Mary's interested in, in these old and abandoned wells that, that uh, are out there. There are millions of these wells across the, the landscape in the United States. And a small subset of them, um, and we're, we're trying to figure out how many have issues. Here's one from Pennsylvania. So that's methane and other gases bubbling out that, that, old, uh, that old tube. Um, Pre-drilling baselines are important. Uh, we just published this analysis for North Carolina. Now, North Carolina is not going to see any oil and gas drilling anytime soon, if ever. Um, with the oil price the way it is and the resource the way it is in that state. But however, we were asked to provide a, 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 a drinking water quality, a groundwater quality baseline if that extraction ever happened. So that, 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 that baseline is now publicly available. Okay, some recommendations for water and we'll, we'll finish up with air. Um, gather as much pre and post drilling data as possible and make as much of it as possible publicly available. Um, keep track of everything. So what's used in the, in the fluids, uh, where the water comes from, where the wastewater goes, how wells are cased and cemented. And of course states uh, and companies do a lot of this and in some states are better at making such information available than others. Um, uh, what are the, where are the old and abandoned wells? How much is a state setting aside for legacy issues to fix problems that might occur in 25 to 50 years? And most of them, in my opinion, aren't setting aside enough. And then to protect landowners and consumers through, through best management practices and rules and, and especially good communication. So that's sort of the first half or two thirds, if you will. Let me finish with uh, a, a couple of air examples and we'll, we'll break for the, for the social. Um, so on the energy side, research in our group is split, split roughly evenly between water issues, which you've heard just a very small snippet about, and then air issues, particularly emissions of, of methane and other gases from operations both upstream from well pads and elsewhere and downstream uh, to the end user, say, in city streets uh, through natural gas lines. And I'll give you some examples of, of these as we, as we go along and, and what kinds of inferences we can make from them. So first of all, just as in water, there's some good things to say about uh, natural gas and air quality too, particularly when you compare it to coal. So not only is, is it better in terms of the combustion of carbon dioxide, it results in about half the, uh, the CO2 use for the same uh, amount of energy or, or, or heat generated as coal does, but it also doesn't emit anywhere near as much sulfur dioxide and mercury, so less than 90%, uh, you know, less, uh, less NOx and particulates. These are things that kill people still in the U.S. today. Um, so I think sometimes the, the air quality issues get, get forgotten um, uh, when, this, when there's all this discussion about the CO2 emissions. And once again, there are other sources, uh, renewables, uh, in this case nuclear, uh, wind and solar, that also have, have zero emissions. So it depends what you compare it to. Um, at the EPA, they estimate that methane emissions occur about equally upstream and downstream. So if we're going to make an investment in natural gas, at which we are making for power, phasing out coal to some extent, we want to minimize leakage uh, of, of methane and other gases from oil and gas operations as much as we can. Everybody has that in their best interest. It's both environmental and economic sense. EPA estimates that leak is about equal upstream and downstream. Um, so about one and a half percent total of the, of the natural gas that's produced 
EPA estimates leak, uh, leaks to the atmosphere. This is an analysis of Adam Brandt's um, that came out last year. Um, so we'll spend a few minutes talking about upstream, but then we'll focus on the downstream part of this and we'll finish. I'll just give you a few more examples. Um, so over the past year, and working with uh, the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, we've sampled about, uh, well, several thousand operations across different shale gas plays. So to, to do something like this, you can take an infrared camera. So if, if you see, if there's an emission from, or a leak from a, a well pad, like a tank, for instance, that emission is not visible with the naked eye, obviously. But it is visible in the infrared. So you can, you can have an infrared camera that allows you to film these. Um, and then to start to ask questions like, what percentage of, of operations leak in a particular play? Does it matter where you are in terms of geology? Does it matter whether it's oil or natural gas? Does it matter who's doing the work? Does it matter what state you're in because of the regulations? So there are all sorts of questions that, that you can ask. These are photos uh, I took a couple weeks ago in the, in the Bakken. It was one of the last places that we've been to. Um, so this is, a, um, this is an example of the kind of thing you can see. Now this is not from the Bakken, this is from Texas, but this would just be uh, an image that you're seeing from the helicopter with an infrared camera. You're flying over the well pad, you'll see in a second. That's the emission that's invisible to the naked eye. Now that's not normal, all right? Depending on where you are, that might be one in 200 well pads. It might be as many as one in 10, which is the kind of range that we see. Right? But if, if you can identify those quickly and cheaply, and particularly if it's the same well pads and the same operations that leak through time, then you can really make a big difference relatively cheaply. And so that's one of the, that's one of the reasons for doing, for doing this kind of work and for, for why so much of this is going on now. So uh, uh, Jacob's here in the audience. He's doing a study on intermittency. When you find a leak, does that operation, does that tank, does that well keep leaking for hours, days, weeks, or months? You can't yet see it in satellite infrared. Now, there, has, there have been satellite studies, and the most uh, well-known one is Eric Court's study that's more at a regional level. He, uh, he was the first author on a paper that targeted or highlighted the Four Corners area uh, of Colorado and Utah as a, as a hot spot of meth, uh, methane leakage. We're not to the point where you can use a satellite to do attribution at a particular well pad. That, that day's coming, though, in the not-too-distant not future. And drones, uh, drones offer another possibility of relatively cheap detection, too. I'm gonna run out of time here. Go ahead. That, that's in Texas. Uh, that's in the Barnett. Yeah, I know. Well, the coordinates were at the beginning, but she wasn't writing fast enough, so we're not going back there. Um, so let's talk about downstream. Then. So I want to, this is my last example, and we'll break. I want to spend a little more time on this because in the last uh, four or five years, we spent a lot of time trying to understand the contributing factors to emissions and leaks in cities. This is work with Nathan Phillips at Boston University, uh, a close colleague. Um, so we took new laser technology, in fact, technology that was developed here at Stanford many years ago, commercialized uh, in the Bay by several companies, Picaro, uh, whose instruments we use here, but also Los Gatos. And there may be some folks from those companies in this room. So these are newly commercially available. We took uh, these brand new laser-based methane instruments and put them in cars and started driving around block by block in cities. And, in, and along pipelines and such to ask, how often do you see a leak? And if you see a leak, what predicts you, what allows you to predict um, that, the, the presence of that leak, or at least the probability that you'll see a leak? So you're seeing here the operations, the guts, if you will, in the car, here and here, the analyzers. Um, the, the sampling tube will be in front of the car. And then once in a while, when we see a big leak, we'll hop out of the car and try and figure out where it's coming from, in the street or from a building or somewhere else. That's John Carr in the lower right. He used to run the mass spec lab for me at Duke. What did we find? Well, first study, and Nathan was first author on this paper. This was Boston. So this is the first publicly available map, if you will, of a city. That's uh, 800 road miles, at block by block, literally, across Boston, uh, 3,400 leaks. We define a leak as an emission that's, uh, well, as a concentration that's 25% above background, so 2.5 ppm is our threshold. The background is about 1.9 or 2 ppm methane. It's a conservative, uh, conservative threshold. Um, so each of these yellow spikes is, a, is a, a leak in a particular place or an emission source. Number one predicting factor for those leaks, old cast iron piping. 
So if you look at the, the percentage, if you will, of the amount of cast iron piping and old unprotected steel piping in a neighborhood, it's that old piping that, uh, that is correlated with the presence of those leaks. So it's not socioeconomic. It's not that poor neighborhoods leak more than rich neighborhoods or anything else. No cows on the street. No cows on the street. Uh, we won't do it today. We do a lot of things, though. So attribution is always an important question, right? How do you know that these are all uh, from natural gas uh, pipelines? Well, they're not all, but the vast majority are, and we know that from isotope use. So we also measure the isotopes of the methane, the C13 values, and we know it from the ethane uh, that we observe as well. Um, so this study, we'll get back to attribution in a second. This study got some quick responses. Within a day, uh, the mayor had commented on it. Uh, at that time, Representative Markey, now Senator Markey, had commented on it. Last summer, Massachusetts passed an accelerated pipeline replacement bill for the state. All right, so it's a bill that doesn't tell people what they can't do. It's a bill that, among other things, does have some requirements in it about reporting and such, but it allows the companies to recover costs to fix pipes earlier than they otherwise would have. Right, so they can front load those repairs. Long term, I think that's a great solution. So if I were guru, which I'm obviously not, the two things I'd like to see happen are, are greater cost recoveries from the public utility commissions. That's the lever that keeps companies from being able to spend more on pipeline repair and replacement. The other disincentive, if you will, is that rate payers pay for the gas that goes missing from the pipelines. So the companies don't pay for that gas, the people do. So my argument is let them front load the cost for the repairs, wean the companies from being paid for gas that they lose long term. But I'm not a guru. All right, attribution. How much in total leaks or is emitted from a place like the Boston Metroplex? So to do that, you can either try and do it 3,400 sources at a time, which is inaccurate and a pain, or you can try and do it from top down instead of bottom up. And the way we did it in this case, this was led by uh, Catherine McCain, a grad student at Harvard now in Steve Wolfsey's lab. Uh, the way we did it here was to put sensors on a couple of the skyscrapers in the city, to put sensors outside the city so that when the wind was blowing into Boston from different directions, you knew what the concentration of methane in the air was, what the concentration of ethane in the air was. Then it moves into the city. You watch that concentration build up so you can see how much extra methane is in the air. And then you can ask, is it really coming from natural gas or might it be coming from capped landfills or the sewer system or something else? And always to be asking, how do we know what we know? The way you know that is if it's coming from the natural gas system, then the methane that's in the air of the Boston Metroplex ought to have the ratio of methane to ethane that's the same ratio found in the pipelines. And that is, in fact, what we see. So through time, the blue line is the average of the pipeline methane to ethane ratio, so about 2% of the, of, the, of the gas, so the natural gas running through Boston's system is ethane. You ought to see that 2% ethane in the atmosphere as well, and we do. So each of these dots is an observation point. If it were 100% natural gas, you'd be along the blue line. We're down here at the red. All right, so in winter, it's about 90% of the methane that flows to the atmosphere. In summer, it's about 60%. The amount's about the same. But in summer, you've got extra emissions from, from wetlands and landfills and biological activity, activity because the temperature's warmer. All right, so we know that most of this is derived from the natural gas system because it matches the ethane signature as well as the, the methane. D.C. was the next city we did. We published that last year. Uh, another old uh, cis, uh, city with lots of old infrastructure, not typical of every city in the U.S., not typical of young cities. So uh, 6,000 leaks approximately in Washington, D.C. Um, here's Capitol Hill, one of the oldest neighborhoods in, in, uh, uh, in the city. Each of these is a, is a spike. So this is leakier than, than Boston was. The Washington Post did an app uh, that people could plug in their address and see what was, what was around them based on our on our data set. All of the above. And actually, we don't, uh, you don't, you can't get at, you can't get information about pipeline materials or agent now publicly. After 9-11, that information was, um, was removed from, from the, sort of the public realm, if you will. I knew someone was going to say that. Those are some pretty high ones. Um, so, you know, what can you do with those data? Well, one of the things you can do is uh, to try and say, well, in what circumstances? There are very, very rare instances of, of explosions. Now, if you look at the data set um, for the last decade, pipeline safety in this country has gotten markedly better over the last 10 or 20 years, right? There are half the incidents per year today than there were a decade or two ago. So that's as a result of, of what the companies are doing 
rules and other things. However, rare incidents still occur. So one of the things we did in DC was when we, we mapped our top 20 concentrations on the street, we hopped out of the car, found out where that gas was coming from. 12 out of those 20 cases, there was an explosive level of methane in the manhole under the street. We called those in, called those 12 in, went back four months later, tested them again. Nine of the 12 were still explosive. Now that should not happen. We can also use this kind of concentration information to triage or to prioritize where to do uh, perhaps repair. So we, right, we present uh, maps of the top 50 or 100 uh, concentrations and sources so that you can, you, know, you can target where to go. That's a mix of economics, of cost, of safety, uh, of other factors. It's not practical to say, go fix 6,000 leaks in DC. Right? It takes decades to do that. But we can try and use the information to help prioritize those leaks being fixed. And finally, in the spirit of prioritizing, my last example, we had a paper that came out a couple weeks ago. Um, that some of you may have seen. And the spirit of this analysis was different. So we wanted to say, how much difference does it make when companies and the public utility commissions and the municipalities get together and partner in these decadal to multi-decadal replacement programs? So for this study, we drove most of the, of the roads in Cincinnati, Durham, North Carolina, and Manhattan. Right, so why Cincinnati and Durham, North Carolina? Those are, well, I was living in Durham, North Carolina, which made it convenient, but that wasn't the only reason. Cincinnati and Durham have finished or are almost finished their pipeline replacement programs. So Cincinnati, for instance, began in 2000 and for the last 15 years they've been marching along to get rid of all that old piping that we've been talking about. Manhattan is, is, has done a lot over the last decade or so, but is still much farther behind. It's more like the rate that Boston and DC and, and other cities uh, take even longer, like Baltimore. So we mapped these three cities and then compared them to to, uh, to what we saw in, in, in Boston and DC. And what we found was that in, 90, that in Cincinnati and Durham, we found 90 or 95% fewer leaks in these cities that, that uh, where these pipeline replacements have been done. So on the one hand, you can say, well, duh, you spend money to fix the pipes and the, and the, and the number of emission sources or leaks goes down. But still, I mean, that's a remarkable uh, decrease in, in the amount. And it's it's uh, benef uh, beneficial from uh, both an economic standpoint in terms of the lost value of the gas, recognizing that it costs more to fix a pipe in Manhattan than it does in Durham or Cincinnati, so it's tougher for the, for the companies working there, right? But it's uh, an improvement cost-wise, an improvement safety-wise, um, improvement air quality-wise. And in the Boston, Massachusetts bill that they passed last year, the, the, um, the, the, the cost of the extra charge for the acceleration was about a dollar a month for the average rate payer and they are expected to get most of that back if they, uh, they reduce the emissions, the leakage of methane and natural gas to the atmosphere. So it was almost a wash for consumers, not to mention the safety benefits. All right, so I'll finish. Justifications for, for fixing the leaks, uh, money. So that, that's almost $2 billion a year on average that the ratepayers pay for gas that leaks into the atmosphere from, from those pipelines. Um, job creation, consumer safety, rare instances, uh, you know, a dozen or so people a year are killed in accidents. Property damage, hydrocarbons catalyze ozone formation. Uh, one thing I've also, uh, I had in the slide earlier but didn't say is one of the reasons we target methane in this kind of work is because where, where a site is emitting methane, it's often emitting other gases. Uh, sometimes those gases might just be uh, heavier, you know, uh, uh, ethane and propane for instance. But in well operations and such, you also have benzene and toluene and xylene, things that are, are much stronger uh, health, uh, health issues, if you will. So by targeting methane, it's relatively easy to measure. We can also get quite a bang for our buck on some of these other gases. And then finally, uh, climate change and greenhouse gas emissions too. So we have a natural gas initiative here on campus that's led by Mark Zoback, um, who's in Australia now working on it. Um, as part of that natural gas initiative, Adam Brandt and I have a proposal for a uh, a mobile methane laboratory, if you will, a set of technologies including a Stanford helicopter. So if anybody wants to give us a Stanford helicopter, um, I'm all ears. And then finally, I'll finish, uh, I'll finish there just with the thought of where will our energy come from. It's an, it's an amazing time for me to be working in this area. I think for all of you, uh, we're, we're seeing so much happening right now. The, the, the shale oil and gas revolution that started a decade or more ago has been absolutely transformational. Um, coal use is dropping, at least in the U.S. On the other hand, in the last five to ten years, the rise in, in solar and wind has also been equally, equally incredible. 
uh, when you look at the decline in the cost curves and reaching cost parity in many markets between renewables um, uh, and fossil fuels, depending on how you uh, define levelized costs and parity and, and subsidies and all of that. Um, so at the same time, there's been this amazing rise in North America for unconventional oil and gas. Around the world, there's an absolute revolution and a boom in solar and wind happening right now. And so that's a race, if you will. It's, it can be a complementary race if, uh, if, if we use our natural gas uh, well. If we reduce emissions, reduce issues for air and water, phase out uh, coal plants and old coal plants in particular. Um, ultimately, we want to be uh, in renewable space, but natural gas can provide bridge fuel uh, if it's done well. The question is, how long will we use it for? Thank you very much. Just have time for a few questions, and then there's wine calling. Mm -hmm, in the back. that as improved sources of energy occur, that the old sources continue to increase exponentially. So very good observation. First of all, let me say, this was, uh, this was the global energy assessment. Um, this was not, not work from our group. I was not involved in this assessment. My co-chair in the Global Carbon Project, uh, Naki Nakisenovich, um, was one of the, the leads of this effort. So you're absolutely right. So at the same time, there's been this incredible rise in, in uh, in renewables, so this sort of darker gold wedge. You see the rise in gas that's somewhat attributable to unconventionals. So here's coal, coal still going up, right? So even as coal use has declined in the US, if you look at our exports, the coal extraction has been about the same. So coal use in China and other countries is, is, is going up rapidly. Well, but what's happening globally, I think in the, in the last couple of years, you, you started to see coal use decline or, or level off or decline globally too. Um, and we can talk about that. That'll be part of our new new budget. But um, but you're absolutely right. If we uh, you know if we keep burning coal more and more globally, then you know all this stuff helps, but it's not going to be enough to slow to slow climate change. There was one more in back, and then we'll move to the front. Uh, my name is Craig Lewis. I'm uh, I work in energy policy, and one of the things that seems like a big risk factor for natural gas in general, but fracking in particular is just the phenomenal number of points of failure that, that could happen from the, from the casing of the wells to the, you know, the leaks along the way to apartment buildings blowing up in Manhattan um, and, and neighborhoods in you know, San Bruno. Uh, so I'm just curious from your point of view, um, seems that natural gas has had somewhat of a free pass um, from clean air, clean water rules and it wouldn't take much to have policy put in place, a few accidents happen here and there, especially in high profile neighborhoods. And all of a sudden you have a whole different dynamic in, in Congress, I would think, for putting natural gas drilling back under uh, kind of normal uh, environmental regulation. Um, what do you, you know, kind of what's your take on that risk factor for the natural gas industry in general? So I suspect some of the people in the room would, might have a different perspective on the industry getting a free pass. Um, I don't, that's not my view of the industry. Um, there are particular policies that hydraulic fracturing has been, uh, some people use the word exempted, some people don't like that word, but uh, the CERCLA, you know, the Superfund bill, the clean, some aspects of the clean water bill. Uh, so particularly for water, there are some areas where I think, uh, uh, I think there are some issues. Um, on the air side, I don't think the, uh, I don't think the, you know, the industry has been given a free pass at all. Um, there are, Stronger rules coming out now released by EPA. Um, there are uh, new rules being applied on BLM on federal lands. Um, there are best practices that are improving independent of, of rules and regulations. So um, I don't know, how about turn it over to somebody else on the floor and give us your perspective. Or not. <laughs> All right, let's move to the front. Uh, I don't see hydrogen on there. You don't see hydrogen on this graph? Right. Well, that's because effectively there isn't, um, and globally there isn't a, this is a, this is a, okay, you're absolutely correct. This is 2050. Yeah. Um, so there isn't hydrogen here because we don't use hydrogen right. globally to speak of. Um, out here, um, you could, it's a matter of, there are hydrogen experts here in the audience, which I'm not. It's a matter of, uh, of cost and, and many other things. So infrastructure, cal take the California example and Governor Schwarzenegger. 
But you're right, you don't see hydrogen on there. Or if it is, it's, it's buried in this renewables uh, wedge. She was, uh, she was next, I believe, right here. That's two she's, right, this she. <laughs> Thank you. So you mentioned before you moved away from this graph that um, coal globally is reduced, re reducing, you see that as well. And what do you think will take to really just kind of flatten that out? Yeah, and of course, this is a projection, not, you know, there's not facts out here, obviously. Um, but in here, it's still increasing. I, I think it's going to be a mixture of different things. Um, I'm re I really, really, really meant what I said about the price parity issue for wind and solar. You know, you could argue that we're not, you know, we're not quite there literally. It depends what market you're in. But um, that is a game changer uh, in terms of, of uh, a long-term energy supply, I believe. When it becomes just as cost effective to, to deploy uh, to deploy wind and solar when, when that wind and solar, at least for solar PV, has no water requirements. Concentrated thermal solar is a different issue. Um, so you have that issue. There are, you have issues uh, in China, obviously, with air quality. I mean, their esti estimates are a million people are dying because of the air pollution a year in China. So China is working breakneck. They're still building coal plants, but they're working breakneck to advance renewables. They built, they built more renewables last year than anybody on the planet. So. Um, so I think it's a combination of uh, pricing, as always, policies to incentivize um, use away from coal, as you're seeing in this country now, and um, um, consumer choice. Here first. Oh, last, oh, last one, the wine calls. Hi. Um, methane is a far more potent <clears throat> greenhouse gas than CO2. What is it, like four times as effective or more? Um, so more than that, it depends what time. So, um, uh, the, so methane is shorter lived than CO2. It's about 10 years on average in the atmosphere instead of 100 to more than 100 years for CO2. Uh, if, so if you take a short time scale, it's uh, more like, I forget the numbers, 80 or so. If you take a longer sort of 100 year time scale, it's more like uh, um, 36 times as potent or so. Wow. So molecule for molecule. It's much more potent, but you have to remember that it's, it's 100 times less abundant in the atmosphere than, than, than CO2 is, right? So it's 2 ppm versus now 400 ppm, right? 200 times less abundant. So, so while we're struggling to get our CO2 parts per billion down, do you think the methane leaks globally are significant in terms of greenhouse warming? Well, yeah, of course they are. I mean, methane is the... After CO2, methane is the, the second most important greenhouse gas that we affect um, through our activities. In the United States, the number one source of anthropogenic, human-derived methane is oil and gas operations, according to the EPA. And then a close second is uh, livestock and ruminants. Um, so absolutely, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's an important source. And if we, uh, there's been a lot of controversy over the last five years, many of you know about, about whether emissions from leakage and emissions from operations might be enough to offset that CO2 benefit you get at the combustion stage. Um, so the, the power plant that burns natural gas uses about, generates about half the CO2 that the coal plant does per unit of energy. But what's the, what are the sources of methane emissions from the coal operation and from the, the natural gas extraction and use? My take on the literature um, is that the work over the last five years suggests that the EPA is underestimating methane emissions from activities, but not to the, ex not to the extent that you're going to see it offset that, that CO2 combustion benefit for, for coal, not to mention the other air quality benefits I mentioned. So this is why, from my perspective, um, it's all about what can we do to, to reduce those emissions. Um, those emissions, those leaks, intentional, unintentional, um, that's one of the motivations for, for this work. Thanks for your time. Thank you.